Good evening. We welcome you in the name of the Lord as we come to our Monday night uh, special services. It's good to see you all here. We see a lot of our friends and uh, folks from the other ARP churches in the area. It's good to have you guys with us tonight. And we'll be continuing on tomorrow night and Wednesday night. It's been great to have Leon with us, and we look forward to him bringing God's word to us tonight. Um, let us listen now to the word of God that calls us to worship tonight as we gather in his name. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Let us pray. Father, we come and we praise you. We praise you for who you are. You are our God, and we are your people. And we gather now to hear you speak to us, to worship you, to give and to pray and to sing. And we thank you for the privilege. We thank you that you've revealed yourself to us, that you've given us a vision of who you are, that we might come to you knowing you. Father, we praise you. But as we come close to you, we see our sin. And we come and we confess our sin. That we are sinful. That we have sinned against you and you alone. That we have sinned. And it deserves hell. And we praise you that you have made a way for us to escape the wrath of God, to escape hell, to escape death through Jesus Christ. And this is the only way. And we come and we praise you tonight that you have opened our eyes, that we might see the gospel and believe the gospel, that we might know that our sins are forgiven and that we are in Christ and we are new creations. And Father, as we come tonight, may we worship you. May we worship you knowing who you are and what you've done for us. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd stand and take your Red Trinity hymnal. We'll be singing number 604, all the verses, all six, of Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, 604.
page 804, and we will read together Psalm 51 responsively. If you would read the bold, I will read the parts that are not bold. Let us read God's word together. <clears throat> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain it. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the Reverend Wayne Dixon is going to come and lead us in prayer. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, thou art truly our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea. Dear God, we come thanking thee for the place in which we are gathered this evening to worship thee. We come humbly seeking your guidance, seeking wisdom by which we might truly adore thee even more than we try because thou art a magnificent God one that has created us in your own image. But truly we slipped away at our own choosing. And yet you created a new way, a way that we might confess our sins and accept your son Jesus Christ into our heart and life and be born again. Now, our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this magnificent crowd that has come to worship Thee. And Father, we pray that each one of us might be inspired this evening by the continued worship of Brother Brown. We thank You, Father, for him and for his uh, dedication to Thee. 
We pray for him as he goes before the presbytery tomorrow, considering transferring into our presbytery and becoming a church planter. How wonderful it would be if he could work it out monetarily, spiritually, and otherwise to become a church planter in the middle of Los Angeles. Father, we are truly inspired by his testimony, by his love for thee, his love for your word. And he realizes very much the importance of that third person of the Godhead that dwells within his heart and walks with him day by day and inspires him to be the person that he is. Father, we thank thee for this, our church, for our pastor. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that you have led us to this opportunity, an opportunity to gather ourselves together with dedicated Christians and come Sabbath after Sabbath, Wednesday after Wednesday, to worship thee. Now, Lord, we pray for those who are less fortunate than we, those who may not have food to eat this very evening, those who do not know you as the Lord and the Savior of their life. We pray for each of those. We pray, Father, that those who do not know you may be fed the spiritual food they need and the ones who are physically hungry may they hunger no more but rather may you through the mighty works of your people provide for their necessity now father we come confessing our sins. And sometimes that's difficult for each of us to look at our lives as fallen human beings who will never be perfect on our own righteousness, but by the magnificent righteousness, righteousness which you imputed unto us, we shall be righteous. Now, gracious Father, bless each one that's here. Bless Kristen as she sings to us this evening. And may we all leave this house of prayer saying that it was good that we went up again into the house of the Lord. Because certainly we anticipate a wonderful blessing. Now, Father, we pray this, our prayer, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
We want to thank Kristen for coming and singing for us tonight. Well, she's our own, but we're also good to have Suzanne Brown back to play, and we appreciate you playing for us tonight. It's good to have Leon coming back into our pulpit tonight. Uh, Leon is a pastor up in Richmond, Virginia, and our sister denomination. Um, he has uh, been a, a church planner there for how many years you been there, Leon? Three and a half. And has done a wonderful work there. And again, we appreciate him coming and being with us and preaching God's word. And we're praying for you, brother. Good evening, church. I'll tell you what, if we were uh, back in Richmond, Virginia, at Crown and Joy, the church that I pastor and Dr. K would have sang like that, we'd have had people standing at their feet saying, girl, you better sing. Uh, but I didn't want to jump to my feet and scare you. Uh, I didn't want to alarm any of you all, so I, I had to behave like a good Presbyterian. But uh, if you do that again, I'm jumping in my feet. So. I would invite you, if you would, please, provided you have a copy of the scriptures, whether a hard copy or an electronic device, to turn in your Bibles, not to the section of scripture mentioned in your bulletin. Uh, rather, uh, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We will consider together this evening verses 7 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Before we hear from our God through the reading and the preaching of his most excellent word, I would invite you to please uh, bow with me as we pray to our God. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been merciful to us. You have enabled us to be here this evening in the midst of a somewhat busy day, in the midst of weather like it is, in the midst of employment, in the midst of family and other relationships. And so we pray that you would continue to be a blessing to us, not merely in your providence, not merely in your common grace, but even now through your word, that you would speak to us and you would conform us into the image of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. So, Father, would you not only hear our prayers, but would you also answer them? We approach you boldly, O Lord, knowing that we can come to you in our hour of need. So speak, Heavenly Father. Your servants are listening. Break down our hardened hearts. Break down, O Lord, the skepticism that exists within us. And cause us to believe every word that proceeds from your very mouth. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being patient with us. Thank you, O Lord, for granting us Jesus. Thank you, our good God, for giving us your Holy Spirit. And we pray all of these things through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, and amen. First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse Seven. As has been our custom since Sunday, I will say the word of the Lord after the scriptures are read, and you will respond, thanks be to God. Verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
the word of the Lord. Indeed, beloved, thanks be to our good God. Have you ever had one of those mornings uh, where things just don't seem to be going well? Uh, perhaps you, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, so you're a little bit cranky. Uh, if you have children, maybe they weren't listening to you like uh, they should be. Uh, your body might be aching in places that it wasn't previously aching. Perhaps, though you may not have children, and you're single, when your alarm went off, you reached over and hit that snooze button. But when the alarm came back on, you didn't wake up, so you were actually running late. Uh, there are many reasons why we can have those kinds of mornings, and there are many reasons why we can be running late, but the one time that you don't want to be running late is when you have to get to the airport, because they tell you that you need to arrive some one to two hours before your plane departs. Well, I was having one of those mornings. I can't blame my children, because I didn't have children yet. I can't blame my wife, because I was in another state. I can't even blame my alarm because it got me up, but I happened to be running late that morning, and so when I got to the airport, not one hour before my plane departed, not two hours before my plane departed, but about 25 minutes before my plane departed, I found myself hustling through the airport. When I, when I do arrive at the airport on time and I see people kind of rushing through the airport, I think, man, it sucks to be you, right? But I, I was that person that morning, and so I scrambled to get to the security gate, I'm trying to see if people will let me get in front of them because my plane's leaving soon, and they just weren't having it that morning. Interestingly, this was in North Carolina, and I was flying back to San Diego, so I was thinking, where's all the southern hospitality? They didn't have it that day. <laughs> so I put my stuff on the conveyor belts. I go through the security checkpoint. I grab my stuff from the other end, and I'm hustling to get to my departure gate. I finally arrive. I'm one of the last people to get on this plane, and as I recall the story, I think they were even waiting for me before they closed the forward door. So when I get onto the airplane, I look down that long corridor, and it seems like everyone is looking at me because I'm that guy. I'm the reason they may not make their connecting flight. So I try to keep in my military posture eyes front. I don't want to make any eye contact with anyone because they might give me a dirty look. So as I have my eyes directly down this airplane aisle, I'm also looking up to figure out where I'm supposed to be seated. And I notice maybe about four or five seats away my seat. There was someone sitting near the window. There was someone sitting near the aisle. And these two men, to put it nicely, were healthy. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I got to kind of squeeze my way in this middle seat, but you know what? I made my flight, so as my mother used to say, beggars can't be choosers, just sit down. So I get to that seat finally, and I look at these two men, and I said, hey, I just want you to know I'm supposed to be seated there. And one of the men looks at me and says, well, we were hoping no one was going to sit there. And I thought, wow, there, there is no southern hospitality here. But, but I, I'm a Christian, and so I'm trying to act sanctified, and I couldn't say what I was thinking, which is I don't blame you for wanting no one to sit in there. There's not a lot of room. But, but instead of saying that, because, again, I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, I decided to respond instead by saying, well, we better have a good conversation then. So what do you want to talk about? Politics, religion, or sex? And they looked at me and they said, well, we don't like... Uh, religion, so let's talk about politics. Shut your mouth. So I finally make my way into that seat. The plane takes off, and for the next hour or so, these men are going back and forth talking about the political landscape of this nation. Spits flying and everything. So I'm sitting here going like this. <laughs> and after a time, they realized I wasn't saying anything. And so they looked at me, and they said, why aren't you talking? I said, because I don't want to talk about politics. They said, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, religion. So they said, fine, we could talk about religion. So I took out my black Bible, and I took them from Genesis to Revelation, showing them the glories of God and Christ. 
And wasn't it Jesus who said in Luke chapter 24 that all of the scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings point to him? So no matter where we are in the Bible, we should be able to get to Jesus the Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. So I'm now speaking to them about the good news of Christianity. We have the only religion that has this good news. And once it was all said and done, I mean, I talked for about two hours. This time they were silent. One of the men looks at me and he says, I've never heard anything like that. And another man also responds, I've never heard anything like that either. So I'm getting excited, and I'm thinking, okay, they're about to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Let's go. They didn't do that. I mean, I was so prepared. I was like, I know where the bathroom is in the terminal. We can baptize you right there. (laughs) Though they didn't call on the name of Christ, It's not my job to sing hymns. I I can't do it. There is no amount of cunning verbiage I can use. I can be as slick as I want to try to be. I can talk about movies and try to weave Jesus in. It doesn't matter what I do. At the end of the day, it's God's responsibility to change hearts. And yet, though I had that privilege to talk to these two men about Jesus, and as we call it in Christianity, the gospel that is the good news Am I the only one responsible for doing something like that? Uh, Because I'm the paid professional, right? I've been to seminary. Uh, I've got tattoos on my arms that have depictions of Bible stories, right? I mean, I'm all in. But is it just me? Am I the only one? Or do you, too, have a responsibility to talk to others about Jesus? The answer is here in 1 Peter chapter 2. So the honor, verse 7, is for you who believe. Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are those who have believed, chapter 1. He's writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, modern-day Turkey, and they have a lot of issues going on right now. They're going through, 1 Peter chapter 1, various trials. Perhaps the government is trying to put their hands into their Christianity and tell them what they can and can, cannot say, where they can and cannot worship. But it's not only having those types of overarching influences that they have to deal with. Chapter 2 says they're also being rejected by men. In a world that claims to be so tolerant, for whatever reason, they are intolerant about this one Jesus. So now these Christians are going through the various trials they're going through. They're being rejected by men, and it's in the midst of that Peter gives these men, women, and children their purpose. We're always looking for our purpose, aren't we? What do I want to be when I grow up? How is that going to affect the world? How is that going to influence my neighbors? What is it going to look like on Facebook? I I mean, I have a purpose. What is it? In verse 9, we're given a part of that purpose. But before even getting there, we hear about different kinds of people who do not believe in Jesus the Christ. We hear about people who reject the Lord. They are rejecting the creator of heaven and earth. And in fact, they are called people, verse 7, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling, verse 8, and a rock of offense. These men, these women, these children have rejected that stone. And what stone? Being in the Navy for 10 years, as many of you know, uh, it gave me the opportunity to uh, travel around a bit. Uh, I do feel a bit uh, blessed this evening that uh, an acquaintance who is now sitting in this service does not have a Marine Corps sweater on. He has a Navy one on. Thank you, brother. 
God bless you. Uh, but being in the Navy, I was, I've traveled around. I've been to Japan. I've been to the different parts of Europe. Uh, one of my favorite places to travel was Paris. And uh, there are many reasons for it. Of course, you have to see the Eiffel Tower, right? Because that's what Paris is somewhat known for. You have to go to the museums, the Louvre, and all these other places. But two of my favorite places to go uh, were the cemetery and cathedrals. And the reason I like to go to those places is because of the architecture. I love architecture. I'm not an architect, but I love architecture. And so I would look at the uh, tombstones and see how intricately they were designed. I would walk up to, as close as I could get to the stone in the cathedrals and just see how beautiful and hand-carved these stones often were. But what I noticed about these stones, it's unlike brick. My house that we just sold is brick, and if you get up close to it, you'll see that the bricks are symmetrical, and they're just lined up side by side. These stones that made up these cathedrals in Paris weren't all symmetrical. Some were wider, some were shorter, but what the builders did was if it seemed like the stone could be disposed, they would take this outer wrapping and put it around the stone. And then they would put filler in, filler in it just to ensure that this was a stone that they weren't going to reject. They weren't going to throw it away. We can find a use for this stone. All we have to do is modify it a little bit and it will be okay. We can put it in the building. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. People who reject Jesus say that there is absolutely no use for him. And it doesn't matter how much you modify him. It doesn't matter how you picture him and what you put around him. It's best to discard him. He's absolutely worthless. And do you know what they do to worthless men? put them on a tree because they are good for nothing. And they see those men that they put on a tree as criminals, as sinners, as lawbreakers. So it's not here that these people just rejected this stone. It's just that they put him to such an extent they wanted to make him as a public spectacle that we're going to put him on a cross. A cross. just a cross, but a place where he can be viewed publicly as a curse. But it's that stone that was and is rejected, this is a quotation from Psalm 118, has actually become the foundation of the entire story. He's the cornerstone or the head of the corner, as some of your translations might say. But he's also a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Uh, one of the words that you'll see throughout uh, the epistles in the New Testament is this word walk, and it's a synonym for just your life as a Christian. Uh, whatever it is your vocation is, however many children, married or single, this word walk is a picture of the Christian life. And some of you walk with a very straight posture. Others of you lean over a little bit. Some of you try to be kind of cool and put a little step in it like this. Whatever the case, one of the things that we do not like doing is stumbling. Uh, because it makes us feel foolish. I mean, it's like being a child back in grade school and you're walking and someone puts their foot out so then you stumble and everybody else laughs at you. It exposes us. That's what Jesus does. He exposes us and he shows us in our stumbling that we're not who we think we are. Facebook tells a story, doesn't it? And since I friended some of you, I know the story it tells of you all. It tells us and the world, the story that we got it all together. Uh, it tells a story that, you know, oh, I'm so glad that I traveled here. I'm so glad that I, I ate this food. And by the way, if I didn't take a picture of it, then it actually is as if I didn't eat it all. So you need to see the picture of the food I ate. I just graduated from college. I just got my PhD. I just had my first child. I'm engaged. I'm single. I'm whatever. Facebook, social media tells a story. But the story that you refuse to tell everyone else is how messed up you are. 
of the story that you refuse to tell everyone else is that your husband doesn't love you like he should. Uh, the story that you refuse to tell everyone else is that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and a part of that sick and tiredness is that you're single and you want to be married. You don't tell that story. You don't tell the story of all the pain that someone else has caused you. You don't tell the story of your own sin. Men, you don't tell the story, and some of you women, about how you've been lusting looking at certain things on a computer screen. Uh, Facebook tells a story that you want others to know about you. The problem is you might be able to fool everyone else, but you're not going to fool Jesus. Because he will cause you to stumble. And hopefully that stumbling will open your eyes to make you realize, I really don't have it all together. I don't love my neighbor as myself. I don't worship God the, the way that I should. As a matter of fact, from the womb to the tomb, all I do is mess up. And God, since he doesn't grade on a curve, his his grading scale is perfection, and that alone, I don't measure up. You don't measure up. You see, when you have to tell people that kind of news, that's the reason they want to reject the God of the Bible. Because after all, and you've probably heard some people even in these pews say this, don't judge. Well, I hate to break it to you, you can judge and you do it all day. But Jesus said, if you're going to judge, judge rightly. You see, we have a problem that we have to overcome, and the problem is our sin. And it's that sin that's going to cause us to stumble, verse 8, as they, or in some cases, perhaps we, were destined to do. talked a little bit earlier about what we do in uh, our home service, especially if uh, Dr. K came down and sang for us, you might be getting an invitation. Uh, but one of the things we also do, especially from the pulpit, is if there is a narrative or if there's a point in an epistle that is leading to the climax, I might ask our church to repeat it. You see those two words in verse 9, but After all of the stuff that was said about sin, after all of the stuff that was said about stumbling and about a rock of offense, but you. Will somebody say, but you? There you go, you can say it again, but you. It makes a difference to know that God, through this Bible, is talking about you who believe. After all the chaos of life, after all the sin, there is a but you. You, beloved, are a chosen race. We like the first part, don't we? We love to talk about the Presbyterians, the doctrine of election. Yeah. That God, before the foundation of the world, chose some to be in Jesus Christ. It's that second word that makes us uneasy. Race. Yes, I said it because the Bible said it. But you see, it here in the scriptures was not limited to the color of one's skin. That's what we did with it. We made race about the color of one's skin. But this term here, biblically, some people will try to tell you to discard the term race altogether. No, 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 it's right here. If you search that Trinity hymnal, it's in there too. Biblically, it included a whole host of different categories. Your political ideology, where you live, your family and cultural traditions, as well as your religious commitment. So when we hear now that you are a chosen race, your political ideologies, your cultural and familiar commitments, where you live, and your religion should all be earmarks that ultimately point to the God who's chosen you, who has plucked you from essentially out of nothing, dead in trespasses and sins. And he says to you, live. Before that, as one actor would say on the sixth sense, all people were was dead. The walking dead. Until the reality of God's election came to the pass in time and space. And you were of none but you. 
I know how you hear that. You hear it, but me, singular. It's a part of American individualism because when you pick up your Bible, you start thinking how to apply it to you. Or if you're thinking more broadly, you start thinking how to apply it to your household. But the you here is you plural, y'all for you Southerners. He's writing, but you all are a chosen race. Stop making everything individualistic. But y'all are a chosen race. And he goes on and he says, you are a royal race priesthood you are royalty and no matter how hard you work no matter uh, what political positions you've had in the past no matter your vocation no matter how much money you have in your bank accounts you can't work for this type of royalty because it's a gift given on account of the one who was and is royal yet dethroned himself and walked this earth some 2,000 years ago as the great high priest, and who went upon a rugged Roman cross as the priest, as the king, as royalty, one who was rich, though became poor, so that in your poverty you might become rich and then wear those royal robes of righteousness. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy individual, a holy nation. What does holiness mean? Let me tell you what you should be careful of saying. Uh, it just means you're, you're other. Uh, you, you might have heard that on some podcast. God is holy. He, he is so other. The problem you're going to have with that is the same God that we're talking about here is the same God who spoke to Moses and said, take off your sandals for the place that you're standing is holy ground. Is the ground somehow other? Holiness is not just about being other. Holiness is about being committed to the purposes of God. And you see, it was that ground on which Moses stood that was committed to the purposes of God. And as a holy nation, we ought to be committed to the purposes of God. Summarized by Jesus to love God and love neighbor and all of in that entails. A people who are set apart, a people who are committed to love and service, a people who are committed, as we hold in the call to worship, to uphold justice. That's another taboo word, isn't it? But I wasn't the one who read it earlier. The pastor read it. We are called to be a holy nation, a people for his own possession. I like stuff. Sometimes it's hard to my fault. Uh, when the latest iPhone comes out, got to have it. Uh, I used to, when I was in the Navy, uh, before I uh, got married and realized money wasn't just mine anymore, uh, I used to buy a whole lot of stuff and uh, TVs and DVDs and speakers and I had a BMW in 2001 and the BMW was a 2001. Uh, I put a $10,000 audio system in it, three televisions, a DVD player, 19-inch rings. I was the guy that when you pull up to the stoplight, you roll up your windows. I'm not ashamed of that. I just like stuff. And much more important than all the stuff that I buy and that you buy, God likes stuff too. Stuff is you. That he claimed for himself. You are a people for his own possession. And who is that purpose from? Remember, go back, I asked you the question, well, what's our purpose? Peter gets to it right here. One of my uh, more memorable witnessing encounters was several years ago, my wife and I flew to Seattle. Uh, and just outside of Seattle, there's a city, Linwood, and we stayed with a family there. It was actually my ex-girlfriend's mom and stepdad. And uh, on New Year's Eve, we had purpose to go to downtown Seattle and talk to people about Jesus. Because like many places, you know, especially major cities, I don't include Lancaster, a major city, 
Um, I'm sorry if that offend. I'm not sorry if that offends you, uh, but uh, we were in Seattle, and uh, we knew a lot of people would be down there, the Space Needle, and whatever they do on New Year's Eve. So my wife and I were going to go down there, meet some other people, and talk to folks about Jesus, give out gospel tracts, all of that kinds of stuff. She ends up getting ill, and so she couldn't go. And so I'm like, honey, I'll stay with you. I'll stay. No, 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 go ahead. I'll stay. No, 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 go ahead. I said, fine, okay, I'll go. So I went. And when I got down there, met up with some acquaintances and some friends, uh, started giving out gospel tracts, started talking to people about Jesus. And one guy pulls out this milk crate, and he turns it over, and he stands up on this milk carton, and he starts speaking to people openly about Jesus. He lifts his voice, and he's just telling everybody about the Lord. Has his Bible out, not one this big, but, I mean, he's got one, though. That would have been pretty awkward, huh, if he stood up there with this and... uh, and so after he is done, uh, no one stopped him. He comes over to me and says, hey, Leon, why don't you get up on this milk cart? I'm like, no, that's for you, man. I'm not worried about it. He said, come on. I said, brother, I'm okay. So he leaves me alone, and I'm continuing to give out tracts and talk to people about Jesus. He comes over to me a second time. He's like, Leon, get up on this milk I said, man, leave me alone. I'm trying to be a Christian. You're getting me angry, right? I don't want to put my hands on you. And uh, he's like, all right. So he goes, he goes away. He comes back the third time. He said, this time. Fine. So I get up on this soapbox, and right behind me there's this metal fence, and my soapbox is there, and about 20 feet in front of me there's this movie theater. And so I open my Bible, I start reading my Bible, and people start stopping. It's all right, so I keep reading my Bible, and I'm lifting my voice so people can hear me because they're loud, it's New Year's Eve. And after probably about 10 to 15 minutes or so, so many people have stopped that no one can now walk through this long boardwalk strip. And so a security officer comes over to me and says, hey, you have freedom of speech. You can say what you want to say here, but you're creating a fire hazard, so you got to do something. So I say to the people, I say, guys, gals, if you want to continue hearing me, I'm going to go around here, and you can follow me. If not, I completely understand. So I get off my soapbox. I pick it up, have my Bible in hand. I walk about 15 feet, hang a left. And there's this concrete slab that was probably half the height of this stage. And so I get up on that slab, and I continue reading the Bible. I continue preaching the word. And this grass mound is in front of me, and the entire grass mound fills up with people. And I preach for about 45 minutes. And in the midst of preaching, these two men come up and stand next to me. I don't know who they are. And once my voice finally gives way, the crowd just dispersed. And I look at these men to my right and to my left, and I said, who are you and why are you standing here? And they said, because uh, we're standing here because we are Christians, and we didn't want anything to happen to you. I don't expect any of you to get up on a soapbox. But I do know that you have the same purpose that I have. Verse 9. You're a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, claimed by God so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let the preachers preach, 2 Timothy 4, but let the entire church proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Talk about his life, talk about his death, talk about his resurrection, talk about his ascension. Because the gospel, beloved, is the power of God until salvation. And without that, there is no hope. So provided that's true, when was the last time you spoke to someone with different religious commitments? When was the last time you spoke to someone like that about a king? See, it's interesting how we can be obsessed here and there. We love our doctrine. We love our Westminster Confession of Faith. We love our larger and shorter catechisms. As a matter of fact, my church memorizes the larger and shorter catechisms. But I will not let them come to the house of the Lord Sunday after Sunday and think that this is just about them and not tell others about the Christ because it is a part of their purpose. And if they are not doing it, if you are not doing it, do you know what it's called when you disobey God? And when your sin is exposed, what's your responsibility? Starts with an R. 
to repent, which means to turn from the sin that you were committing and then turn to the Lord who receives you, but then also turn to right action. Do your neighbors know that you are a Christian? I know in the South everybody says they're a Christian. That's a lie. But do they know? Or is it just a matter of, well, they see you leaving on Sunday mornings around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, whatever it is, and so they start to try to put some one and one together, and perhaps maybe they're religious, maybe they're not. When you go to the same post office that you go to, when you go to the same grocery store that you go to, when you go to your school, when you go to wherever you go, do these people know that you're Christian? Not simply in name only, but because of the word 